Today's Oilers Nation Radio Division preview is delivered by DoorDash. Use the promo code ONRADIODD to get you 15% off and no delivery fees on your first order. Another Oilers Nation Radio Pacific Division preview, and uh, today we are going to stay in Canada. We are heading out to the coast to talk a little Vancouver Canucks. Chris Faber from Canucks Conversation and CanucksArmy.com is going to join me in just a few minutes here to go through what the Canucks got up to over the offseason, and it was actually a pretty busy summer for Patrick Alvine and Jim Rutherford, the tandem in charge of roster management for the Vancouver Canucks. And before we get into that, Let's look back at what they're kind of building on. It was a brutal start last year for the Vancouver Canucks. They were just barely getting by in December, but things turned around kind of like for the Oilers once they made a coaching change. And it was Travis Green, who was honestly a lame duck coach. Like he was heading into the last year of his deal sort of thing. Uh, He goes out the door, Bruce Boudreaux comes in, and it kind of signified a big culture shift for the Canucks. And they went on an absolute roll. I think the point pace they were playing at for the last, you know, three, four months of the season was like over 100 points over the course of 82 games but they end the year with 92 points on the season so if they want to make the playoffs this year they're pretty much going to have to be I mean the playoff cut line for a wild card spot last year was 97 points so they really only have to be five points better and when you look at what they did this offseason you know, I think you can kind of see a path to them being at least five points better. They're obviously hoping for more consistency from guys like Elias Pedersen, who were there last season, but they went and sort of rounded out the edges of their forward group. I mean, they could maybe be hoping for steps forward from Vasily Podkolzin and Niels Hoglander, but they went and got Andre Kuzmenko, the free agent out of Russia, who a lot of Oilers fans, including myself, really wanted to see Edmonton go and get. They also got Ilya Mikheyev from the Toronto Maple Leafs, a guy that scored 20-plus goals in just 55 games last season. So if he plays in all 82, I mean, maybe he's a guy who pops 25 goals home playing on the Vancouver Canucks third line. So their scoring depth looks better. Between the pipes, they're always going to be set. Thatcher Demko is that good. He's a guy who is 26 years old. By the time he's 30, I, I believe he has at least one Vesna trophy under his belt. So Thatcher Demko is always going to be solid for them. Their forward group really does look good again. They've erased the big question mark around JT Miller by signing him to a long-term deal worth $8 million per year. We'll see how well that ages. I mean, he had a tremendous season last year, um, but it was definitely a career year. And the Canucks are paying him based on that career year, something he's never really done before. Uh, He posted 32 goals, 67 assists, and 99 points. Is he... Close to 100 points again? I I don't think so. He shot 15.5%, which, I mean, he's one of those guys that's always had a pretty high shooting percentage, so maybe he keeps up the 30-goal pace. Maybe he's closer to 80 points. Still, $8 million price tag, a lot of money. We'll see how well that deal ages. The big question marks for the Canucks, though, it's not about Miller. It's not really about Pedersen or anyone in the forward group or the goaltending. It's on their blue line where they just don't really have a lot of good pieces. Like, if you're sitting there worried about the Oilers' blue line and if that's good enough to get them through the regular season, which I have, I mean, you'll feel better about them when you go look at what the Canucks have going on. Quinn Hughes, elite offensive defenseman, 22 years old, going to get better in his, better in his own end, likely, all that stuff. Oliver ekman Larson, $7.2 million dollars. Solid top four left-handed defenseman, you know, maybe not as good as some people remember him being in his sort of late 20s out in Arizona, but he's still really good. Tyler Myers, he's overpaid, but he's solid. Tucker Pullman, sure, third pairing D-man, but the Canucks likely need him playing in the top four. And then it's Travis Dermott, Luke Shen, and Kyle Burrows are the other D-men currently listed on their roster. It's not great, and there's not even really a lot of guys coming up through the minors. You know, like the Oilers have Broberg. And Broberg could surprise and steal a roster spot and be a really good third-pairing D-man for them all season. I don't see anyone on the Canucks who's going to just have a hugely surprising season and come through and carry this blue line or give them another solid blue liner. It really does feel like they're just going to kind of limp their way through the season and try to find a trade at some point. The only issue is, like the Oilers, they don't have a lot of money either. As of right now, they're you know $2.7 million over the cap. They'll send down Michael Furland. They do have Danny DeKaiser in camp on a PTO, but he's not going to be like a top four solution for them. Not even close. He might not even make the team. So their blue line is a big, big concern. I believe they're probably good enough to push for a playoff spot. Thatcher Demko in a high-end offense, that could very well be enough in a tight Pacific division where I kind of have them 
somewhere in that middle tier of teams below Edmonton and Calgary, in that order, obviously. But between them, LA, Vegas, you know, maybe Anaheim finds a way to surprise us. But it really feels like there's three teams competing for the final division spot and then ultimately competing with the teams in the central for wildcard positioning as well. So it'll be really interesting to see how things shake out in Vancouver. To get a little deeper on this, let's bring in our friend Chris Faber from Canucks Army. Continuing our Oilers Nation radio division previews with a stop out on the coast in Vancouver where Chris Faber from Canucks Conversation joins us and Canucks Army. Faber, exciting times because you guys are going to five days a week. That is quite the workload. Yeah, I'm jacked up for it. It's going to be like morning skate and then bang right off to uh, to record the podcast every day. It's going to be an absolute blast. I live like on top of Rogers Arena. Uh, so we're jacked up, man. I'm so excited to see Uh, what we do with video and five shows a week. So Vancouver, it's popping over here. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about that team you cover in the Vancouver Canucks. I'm going to start you off with an easy one here, or at least maybe it's easy. I don't know. But what gives you reason to believe the Canucks will be better this season than they were last season? Well, I think going out and getting someone like Ilya Mikheyev uh, helps the penalty kill, which really sunk the Vancouver Canucks at the start of the season. Um, it's something that JT Miller's talked about. It's something that Bruce Boudreaux's talked about. Uh, it was something that kind of had to be addressed by the new management group uh, in the offseason. I think adding players like Curtis Lazar, uh, potentially Dakota Joshua being an example, and Ilya Mikheyev, a guy who you know looked like a great penalty killer for Toronto last year, uh, at least that's something that the Canucks can look forward to. They didn't really do a great job addressing their defense as much as it needs so much help. Um, so that's a little unfortunate in that aspect, but they did go out and get some forwards that looked like they can help on the penalty kill uh, and seeing what the Canucks did last year. I mean, to start the season, they were you know historically bad uh, on the penalty kill. It felt like some games we, you know, we were going by some weeks and a week would pass and the Canucks are giving up like six power play goals in a seven day stretch. So that was kind of, tough to do and and tough to take in for Canucks fans, but at least going out and getting some of these free agents that they went after came as a little bit of a surprise, I think, to just see so many forwards be signed when Canucks fans were very aware uh, of how the team needed to improve on the back end, but at least the forwards that they went out and get are the type of players that can really help on the penalty kill. So that's, I guess, a way that we can look at the offseason a little bit optimistically. You talked about the blue line and maybe the concerns there, but one reason to think maybe it won't actually hurt their chances is because of the man between the pipes, right? Like if any goalie can overcome having a subpar defense in front of him, it's Thatcher Demko. Like he might be their most important player next year, right? He absolutely is. I mean, when you have Quinn Hughes and you have Elias Pedersen on your team, um, you know, you you might be able to sneak by if they if one of those players ends up missing like three weeks of the season due to an injury. But I'll tell you, if Thatcher Demko's gone, there's a lot of question marks about the backup in Spencer Martin. He showed extremely well in his limited size in the NHL last year, but this is a guy who came in and was like fifth on the depth charts uh, for this team to start last season. Spencer Martin's going to be the backup for Thatcher Demko, and yeah, there's going to be big questions about him, even if he can play about 20 to 30 games, depending on what they want to do for the workload for Demko, but he, he absolutely is the most important player on this team. If, if the Canucks are going to win games and make it into the playoffs, you're going to have to have another excellent season from Thatcher Demko. And I tell you, at $5 million, I feel like because of the cap hit that he has for the next four years here, it kind of feels like this is why the Canucks might be going a little bit more towards the all-in. I, I don't want to say that the, the management group has gone all-in, but they've definitely pushed some chips into the middle uh, with how the, the additions that they've attempted to make here in the offseason and the changes that they've done to the forward group. It just feels like they're trying to capitalize on Thatcher Demko being a player who I think is very underpaid for, for what he brings to the Vancouver Canucks on a nightly basis. I mean, this guy is stealing games to the Vancouver Canucks. He did it throughout last season i expect him to do a lot of it again this year and and hopefully the canucks and they added firepower to their forward group and kind of help balance out the scoring a little bit and give thatcher demko some more wins and losses man i mean you talk about that value of a contract at five million bucks like spencer knight just signed in florida for four and a half million he is nowhere near the proven goalie demko is like when that extension comes around, it's going to be double what it is. So I, I think you're bang on with that. Like as much as maybe people on the outside don't realize that this Canucks team and management feels like this is their window right now. And I think we saw that as well in the signing of JT Miller, who again, from the outside, I was stunned. It didn't really sound like anything was really going to be that close. So much of the summer had gone on with the trade rumors. There's moments at the draft where it's like, oh, he's going to the Islanders. It's almost done. It never happened. Now it seems like he's going to be a Canuck for the next six, seven years here. What did you think of that extension? Were you were you surprised as well when you saw it come across the desk? 
I absolutely was. And I, I think it was even interesting hearing Quinn Hughes talk about it with Elliot Freeman. Like he was surprised uh, <laughs> like to, to hear a player come out and say that. Um, I think Canucks fans were in the same boat where it, it felt like last year, the trade deadline, that could have been an opportunity, but because the Canucks were pushing so hard, they, they kind of wanted to give their players a chance. And, and then I just don't think the returns ended up being what a lot of fans hoped that it would be. I mean, over here in Vancouver, people were thinking first round pick prospect and then plus like adding maybe a third line center down the road. Um, I know that there was a lot of interest from Canucks fans with the Rangers and potentially Braden Schneider just feel like the, uh, like the Rangers didn't really want to move on from Schneider. There's he's a player that they wanted to kind of keep moving forward. You can kind of see that with the ice time and also the situation with Niels Lundqvist over there uh, in New York, obviously trading him. It felt like that was maybe the guy that they wanted to move in a package for JT Miller, but it, it didn't end up getting to that point. And, and I think the management group kind of talked about this of just kind of balancing what this team could have added in a JT Miller trade. And I'm sure they had offers on the table. I mean, to, to think that JT Miller was making five two five this season, a lot of people would have been interested in him just as a rental, right? Like coming in at, at what he did last year, putting up 99 points. There's a lot of teams around the league that absolutely would have just even thought about him as a rental and potentially down the road, looking at him to be a guy that they could sign long-term. But I don't think the Canucks had a bad deal here with JT Miller making $8 million after this year. It just feels like you mentioned that the Canucks are kind of acting like they're going into their window. It's kind of strange to think that you're opening up your window after missing the playoffs horribly in the bubble year. And then last year having such a horrid start that they did yeah. and, and don't get me wrong, great finish to the year. That's awesome. They you know put up a, a pace that looks like they should be in the playoffs if that's how they play, but you can't guarantee that they're going to have the same spark as they did with Bruce Boudreaux uh, this season. So it is a little interesting to kind of go all in and think that your window's wide open coming off of a, you know, back-to-back -back seasons of not making the playoffs. Yeah, um, one player who kind of had an up-and-down season as well was certainly Elias Pettersson. What are your expectations for him this season? Yeah, I think this is the year where you're kind of expecting the breakout, right? Like, this yeah. is the year where Pettersson needs to be a point per game. Um, he's shown that he absolutely has the potential to do it. Um, you know, and that's even putting away like the first 10 NHL games, scoring 10 NHL goals. That was all great. But then you wanted to see him kind of develop a two way game. And he did that. I think he's a player who shows extremely well in his own zone, whether he's playing on the wing or playing at center. It just seems like he's always a guy who's really helping out defensemen down low. And that's massive. So that part of the game, I think, has been like such an improvement for Pedersen since he's come into the NHL is wow. Like he was always smart. I think he was always smart defensively, but now he's kind of put the physical traits together to really understand how to be a good defensive player. And for now it's, it's like now, but can you get back to that really high end potential offensively? Right. Cause I don't think there's a lot of questions about how he plays defensively. And when you see him at his best offensively, you're like, wow, he's got an incredible shot. That one time around the power play is great. His wrist shot coming down when he's confident, it's excellent. Uh, and now that he's not bad, battling any injuries like he was last year to start the season where, you know, his wrist was giving him problems. He had to worry about a contract throughout training camp. Like there was a lot of questions uh, for Elias Pettersson. And I think this year is the year where, you know, he shaved his head. He's turning into a man. Like there's a lot to go here with Elias Pettersson. Uh, and if he can really crank it up this season, I feel like this is the year he breaks out and, and gets that point per game ratio that a lot of people expect uh, for him to hit in some time in his career. I, I think this is the year where he starts to become uh, talked about as a point per game player in the NHL. And wouldn't that be just a massive boost for the Canucks when you look at the depth they could potentially have down the middle with him and Horvat, depending where you play Miller, things like that. Um, you are a big prospect guy. That is your bread and butter, Chris. So I want to ask you, uh, what, what uh, prospects are you keeping an eye on this year in the Canucks system? Yeah, I think the the most recent first round pick, Jonathan LeCaramacchi, I think, you know, a lot of scouting outlets had him as kind of a top 10 pick. Um, he's a player who's extremely gifted and on the power play. I think that's a spot where you have no questions about Jonathan LeCare and Mackey. He's going to bring it every night uh, on the man advantage. He's kind of uh, – his team got demoted to the Alsvenskan League, so the second tier down there in Sweden. So he's going to get a lot of opportunities to be a top six player and be able to make an impact. So keeping an eye on him, uh, as well as just down the road here, our AHL team, we saw Danilo Klimovic come in as an 18-year-old uh, last year in the AHL. Showed okay, I think put up 14 points last year, but also the fellow like he didn't have a lot of bounces kind of go his way as an 18 year old in the AHL, you're asking a lot of a player. Um, and I think though he didn't light up the league, he was still 18. He still only played Belarusian junior hockey. He even joked about it at young stars camp. And I asked him about it. Like 
he laughed that he's like, it was a massive success. I went from the Belarusian junior league to the AHL. Like think about it. Like Ty, did you think anybody in the world had a bigger jump in hockey and skill from the Belarusian second league to the AHL? Like I don't think anyone in the world had to make that jump. So for him to come in now as a 19 year old, uh, it's going to keep an eye on him. He obviously lit up the U 18s. Uh, that's kind of why he was drafted by the Vancouver Canucks in the second round. So hoping to see a little bit more offensive potential in Klimovich's game as well. I've been asking everyone who's hopped on and done one of these previews with me the same question to end things off. Uh, give me your sort of power rankings here in the Pacific Division. Rank uh, the teams you think are going to make the playoffs. Like who's getting in and who's winning this division? Um, I'm going to go with the Flames winning this division. Uh, I think that somehow they improved with the soft season, like incredible job by them throughout. Yeah. Uh, I think the Oilers probably finished second. They're you know you can't knock the firepower that they have. Um, and, I, and honestly, man, like I, I thought this looking at the team in the playoffs last year, I thought like, you know, the Oilers roster actually does not have as much of a big concern on the defense as it did in years past. Like I was looking at that top six that they were putting on playoff games. I'm like, oh, it's not that bad, actually. Like it's it's average at least. And I mean, when you have McDavid and dry saddle, your, def- your defense kind of only needs to be average at that point. So it'll kind of rely on goaltending for them. Uh, and then after that, I mean, I'm not really sure what Vegas is going to be. The Canucks are going to be kind of in that mushy middle there as well. Kind of, I think fighting for a wild card spot. I do think the Kings take a jump this year. I, I think that the Kings have kind of pushed in uh, their chips. It's not really all in, but in a similar way to the Canucks have decided to push some of their chips into the middle. The only difference for me is like, man, that, that Kings team compared to the Canucks is so young and so skilled that um, I think they could be a team that does surprise a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go with the Kings coming in third. And then I think the Canucks really fight for a wild card spot. Uh, and then Seattle finishes last. They suck. So yeah. uh, that's kind of the way that I'm looking at uh, this division. The, the, the Ducks will probably be down there as well. So uh, that's kind of the way I see it playing out. I'm going to go Flames, Oilers, uh, Kings, and then we'll see if the Canucks can kind of battle with the Vegas Golden Knights for kind of that wild card spot. But, you know, wild card's a good spot to have the Vegas Golden Knights because I don't know how things are going to go down there this year. Yeah, it's going to be wild there. I uh, I keep joking that I've already pre-written my trade deadline articles for the Oilers. They'll be looking for <laughs> a left shot defenseman. It's just like, we know come February and March, we're talking about left shot D-man. Uh, same thing for the Canucks. Like, if they're in the hunt, I'm looking right now. They have all their draft picks this season, plus an extra one in the fourth round. All their draft picks next year as well. I guess they lost a seventh rounder in this coming draft, but you get what I'm saying. They have assets. Do you think it's going to be Canucks need a D-man at the deadline this year, and that'll be the number one look? They better not. They, you know, the Canucks need a D-man in their prospect system. They got nothing coming up uh, in the defense core. I, I wish that the Canucks kept all their picks this year, and I hope that they go into the NHL draft this coming season and they draft seven defensemen. Like, that's what I want the Vancouver Canucks to do uh, with their prospect pool. I think that we've heard Patrick Alvin, the new general manager, talk about not wanting to trade away high picks. I don't think he's going to end up doing that uh, at the deadline. I think if the Canucks get into the playoffs this year, it's it's – good it's great but at the same time i think you want to look down the road a little bit more before you still start to go all in but i don't know we'll have to see what happens jim rutherford is uh, obviously a guy who likes to make trades so we'll see what happens around the the trade deadline anyways but i i hope they hold on to those picks and, and i'm not even kidding like draft seven defensemen next year at the draft down in Nashville. Uh, I would absolutely love that for the Canucks prospect pool. I, uh, I should have seen that coming, that kind of an answer from the prospect king of Canucks <laughs> Army. Chris Faber, thanks for your time, man. Enjoy the season. We'll chat soon. You betcha, Ty. This is a blast. Have a good one, man. All right, that is a wrap on another Oilers Nation Radio Division preview. We have already crushed out Anaheim, San Jose, Vancouver, Vegas, and Calgary, which means there is only two teams to go. We got the LA Kings and the Seattle Kraken coming up in the next seven days for you. Another episode of Oilers Nation Radio, the full version of the podcast, is coming up on Friday as well. But we are getting close to the beginning of the NHL season. It's going to be a ton of fun. If you're listening to this, make sure you keep your eyes and ears peeled for Oilers Nation every day. My new daily live show, 12 Mountain Time, live on our Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter accounts. That gets going next Monday, October 3rd, every single day, Monday to Friday, plus on the on the weekends when the Oilers have a game on a Saturday. We'll be going live to talk Oilers, and yes, it will be available in podcast form as well. So look for that wherever you get your podcast from. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. I'll chat with you again on Thursday when we do another one of these Oilers Nation Radio Division previews.